Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to formally welcome you to the NAPC Fall Council Meeting being held on Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you all for making time uh, to come here today. We have a pretty important agenda and we have uh, an award to give out. And I know that we all share in the celebration of that. Um, for those who are without power on the South Shore, my thoughts are with you at this time, and I hope your internet connection stays stable and your family stays safe. Um, so at this time, I'm going to review the meeting technologies and the norms for participating and the voting. So this open meeting of the NAPC Council is being conducted remotely consistent with the Governor Baker with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, uh, which has been extended and suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. This order, which is posted along with the agenda at MAPC's website at mapc.org backslash about dash MAPC backslash legal slash notices slash meetings allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Accordingly, the public may view the proceedings live streamed uh, at youtube.com backslash user backslash MAPC Metro Boston. For this meeting, the MAPC Council is convening its membership uh, by video conferencing via Zoom. Council members receive their login credentials when registering for the meeting. If you have not already done so, uh, council members, please rename yourself with your full name and affiliation. So for instance, I'm Erin Wortman, uh, representing Stona, uh, but say you are representing an agency or ex officio like Juan Vega, it would be Juan Vega, E-O-H-E-D. Uh, please note this meeting is being recorded um, and most members are participating by video conference. So please be aware that if you can see um, each other, we can most likely see you if you share your camera. And the recording of this meeting and, um, and any um, affiliated uh, conversations will be posted to the MAPC website as soon as practical. So uh, with that, um, and I just wanna say it's really important that we do identify ourselves. Um, because staff, hi staff, um, is currently uh, taking quorum, taking attendance, taking quorum, uh, and we will take attendance um, before the business uh, session begins. Um, and I'll explain that when we get to it. But first, I would like uh, to get to our next point in the agenda, which is the presentation of the Theodore Mann Regional Leadership Award. Uh, so I'm going to call on Mark to introduce um, Rick, Richard from the Mann family. Um, so Mark, take it away. Aaron, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, I hope our numbers are not too much smaller because of the power outages, but uh, we'll just have to work with that the best we can. Uh, one of the, the great traditions at MAPC is the annual uh, awarding of the Mayor Theodore Mann Regional Leadership Award uh, in memory of the great late mayor of Newton, Teddy Mann, whom I had the pleasure to work with early in my career. Uh, this award was in existence when I came to MAPC and we've given it every year to mayors, to managers, to municipal officials who have demonstrated regional leadership as one of their core values. Uh, we have never given it to an official in the public health arena. And I am very pleased today that we are able to do that uh, in recognition of some great work that that sector has accomplished in the course of the pandemic. Uh, last year, we were not able to give the Man Award, but this year we're back up and rolling. And it is my pleasure and uh, honor to introduce uh, the son of the late Mayor Man, Rick Mann, a good friend and colleague of MAPC, 
Rick will uh, introduce uh, other members of his family if they are present this morning, and he will present the award. Uh, Barry Keppard, our public health director, will have a few uh, comments to make after Rick concludes. Rick, take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. I particularly want to thank you uh, for the delicious breakfast buffet we had uh, just before the meeting. Thank you. Um, you'll make it up next year, I'm sure. Uh, I believe I'm being joined this morning by my sisters, Stacy Shapiro, Leslie Mann Kaplan, and Debbie Mann Schmill. Um, I hope they are there with us. Um, good morning to everybody. My siblings and I are pleased to participate once again in a tradition now spanning over a quarter of a century of recognizing the regional achievements of dedicated public officials in the spirit of our father, Teddy Mann. Today, we modify our 25 year tradition in a number of positive ways. For the first time, this award is being given in a virtual setting, a sign of the precarious times that we live in. And for the first time, we give it not to an individual, but to three remarkable individuals who have provided regional leadership at a most critical moment in our history. And for the first time, as Mark Grayson indicated, we are giving this award to municipal professionals in the public health field. It could not be more appropriate to do so at this time. Never before in the lifetime of any of us have we faced a greater existential threat to our communities, our country, and the rest of the world than the threat that is posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Never before has there been a greater need for all of us, but particularly our leaders in public health, to speak out and act in a unified, comprehensive, and consistent manner. Never before has the true meaning and importance of regionalism been more evident. Meredith Hurley, Lauren Buck, and Flora Amaya are the respective health directors of Winthrop, Revere, and Chelsea, and are the key partners in the North Suffolk Public Health Collaborative coordinated by MAPC. These three communities have experienced some of the most severe effects of COVID-19 in the entire Commonwealth caused by a myriad of factors, including economic, occupational, housing realities, and pre-existing health conditions. They have been leaders in their hard hit communities during the most trying of times. And despite the pressures to the contrary, they have chosen to work together, learn from each other, sharing best practices and confronting their challenges together. Through their efforts, They've succeeded in building strong cross-community relationships that have promoted their respective communities' understanding and response to the pandemic. Each of these remarkable individuals has provided consistent and inclusive leadership around actions such as testing, masking, social distancing, et cetera, in their communities. Often doing this work in close partnership with community organizations and residents, reaching out to the community literally door to door. They have developed and implemented plans for the sharing of staff and services, such as hiring a regional public health nurse, an epidemiologist, and creating their own contact tracing function to track COVID cases. They have developed and implemented plans for sharing staff and services. And in addition to that, have recognized the needs of the residents in order to serve them and to provide those services directly, including food, housing, subsidies, and medicine. Following the approval of the COVID-19 vaccines, they have helped plan and execute numerous clinics, beginning with joint clinics for public safety for staff. Can even imagine who that would be. And I thought I turned my phone off. <laughs> I apologize profusely. Following the approval of COVID-19 vaccines, they helped plan and execute numerous clinics, beginning with joint clinics for public safety staff and older residents, and progressively work to connect with all eligible residents. Their work has resulted in a broad vaccine coverage across each of their municipalities stronger connections in municipal departments and community organizations and new initiatives that are addressing other health behaviors 
like substance use disorder and the effects of climate change. The results have been inspiring. Grim statistics reflecting higher than statewide rates of infection have been replaced by higher than average rates of vaccination and plummeting rates of infection. It is no exaggeration to say that through their coordinated efforts, literally thousands of lives have been saved. Beyond that, their work has served as a model of public service and local leadership, strengthened by strong cross-community partnerships. They epitomize the type of selfless and cooperative approach to governance that was exemplified by Teddy Mann. This is a governance approach that is needed not only in times of crisis, but even in so-called normal times in recognition of the fact that problems faced by municipalities do not magically terminate at some artificial border any more than does the COVID-19 virus. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my entire family and the MAPC, it is my honor and privilege to present the 2021 Pedro D. Mann Regional Leadership Award to Meredith Hurley, Lauren Buck, and Flora Amaya. Congratulations to all of you. Rick, thank you so much. And we'll, we can we can applaud and we can put applause into the into the reactions as well, <laughs> if you wish. Uh, it is an honor for us to be engaged with your family, Rick. Uh, and it's wonderful to have you and your sisters here today. Um, as I said, I had the honor in my early career to work with Mayor Mann. He was a force of nature. Uh, we could use more like him today. And uh, thankfully, we have a lot like him in our region. Uh, I want to call upon Barry Keppard, our Director of Public Health, to add a few words. And then I believe that Floor uh, is going to be saying a few words as well. Barry. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you, Rick, for those really wonderful words. I think you really spoke to essentially the, the spirit and the actions of, of Meredith, Lauren, and Floor, and, and the many folks that work with them to support the kind of public health in each of their communities and municipalities. Um, real briefly, I read a quote yesterday kind of that, that made me think about all three of you coming into the conversation today, which was the connection between health and dwelling is one of the most important that exists. It's something that was said by Florence Nightingale. And sometimes there it might just be anticipated that that means the home that we live in, but I think it actually means the community that we live in and the communities we move across. Um, I think just the way that each of you see the, the residents as full humans, in the municipalities that you are and the way you kind of work with them and kind of meet them where they are is really incredible. And occasionally we have those moments where essentially we see the tip of the iceberg, but sometimes the water recedes and we see all the work that happened below that tip that we see. And it, it is really incredible and just cannot say enough for everything that happens that we know is unseen, but speaks to all those things that Rick just spoke to in terms of both kind of meeting people in the pandemic, before the pandemic, and now the response coming out of it too. So just great congratulations. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Mark, and then to Flora. But congratulations, Meredith, Lauren, and Flora, on behalf of us and the team at MAPC. Thank you, Barry. Uh, we at MAPC are all honored uh, and humbled, to be perfectly honest, to work with these three women and also with so many other public health officials who have given above and beyond in the course of the pandemic. It was never easy. It was not always successful but there were so many unsung successes. Uh, and uh, my hope is that we at MAPC are going to use this work and this experience to focus even more deeply on public health infrastructure, on strengthening that, strengthening that part of our municipal field, and on providing the resources that are needed for the dedicated professionals who work in this field. Uh, as I think many people on this call know, we were concerned about the lack of public health dollars being considered for state of ARPA spending. And uh, yesterday, when the House came out with its plan, there was a fairly substantial uh, amount of money dedicated to public health, which is something that we are very proud of and something that we've been working on for the last several months, uh, led by Lizzie Wyant on our staff and by Barry. Uh, and uh, I hope that is just an indication of one way in which we are going to continue to work with these folks and on these causes well beyond the pandemic. So I'm going to call upon Floor now uh, to speak. Uh, with great congratulations, and then I'll see if Meredith or uh, Lauren want to add any words. Uh, Flora Maya, City of Chelsea. Hello, 
Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you MAPC um, for this recognition. I feel extremely honored to be part of the North Suffolk Public Health Collaborative and to share this award with Lauren and Meredith. Um, my initial contribution actually to Chelsea's initial pandemic response was as a volunteer packing food boxes on Marginal Street in Chelsea. And from the sidelines, I witnessed our communities come together to respond to the pandemic. Um, and sorry, I, every time I think of that moment, I'm actually choked up because I felt immense pride at how our communities came together, how our uh, residents, community-based organizations mobilized so quickly um, to respond to this and meet the needs of our residents. Um, I joined the city of Chelsea in February 4th, 2021 and had the honor of meeting in my city people responsible for that initial response, um, who were, of course, our city manager, Tama Brusino, our deputy city manager, Nat Keith, and our public health nurse, Lara, uh, Paula Manhattan, um, who guided the city's contact tracing and ensure that our community was safe. Our current success in vaccin vaccination rates is the exemplary collaborative work of um, across multiple sectors and across municipal borders. Sorry, I'm actually very nervous. <laughs> and within the city of Chelsea, I really want to acknowledge our community-based organizations, La Colaborativa, Green Roots, Chelsea Black Community, our COVID ambassadors for on the ground approach uh, related to vaccine education. And also I want to acknowledge our um, the, the Chelsea project for supporting a lot of our surveillance and data monitoring system that guided our on the ground interventions. Uh, without their efforts, without our community-based organizations, having those one-on-one -on -one interactions with our residents, our vaccination clinics would not have been successful. Um, and lastly, to say I feel fortunate to share uh, this space with Lauren and Meredith and to be on the same team is an understatement. I am very hopeful that as we move forward in strengthening our public health systems, the lessons learned through the pandemic will be key in uh, facing any future challenges um, we may have. Um, and thank you all for your support, recognition, and for this honor. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, let me see if Meredith or Lauren wish to say a few words. Meredith. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, that's going to be a tough one to follow. <laughs> floor is amazing. Same as um, I think the, the world of, um, of Floor and Lauren and Barry and um, his team over at MAPC. And thank you to the Mann family and MAPC for this honor. It's very humbling, um, especially to hear your gracious words. As we're also acutely aware of the negative impacts of this pandemic, um, the partnership and the collaboration that has been forged and deepened um, through the leadership of MAPC during this pandemic um, has been nothing short of amazing. Um, you know, we're seeing such a rapid decrease of public health officials um, through burnout, through, you know, stress that um, this collaboration, more so for me, has been just a, a source of constant support. Um, you know, the three, our three communities, I feel like have been extremely supportive of our roles, um, whereas, you know, we see so often in the press this, this conflict that's happening um, in, other, in other communities. And um, I know I myself have never experienced that and I'm, and I'm grateful for that, um, given the work that we do every day. Um, so, you know, I, I come from a nursing background. I stepped into this role about three years ago, which is really interesting that I'm the, I'm the oldest of the three of us in this experience. Um, you know, being here for three years. Um, but this is my first true experience integrating into municipal um, municipal government. And without the leadership of, of MAPC, I think that um, we would have had a much harder time. So thank you. Um, 
for all of your, your support. And I look forward to, as Flora said, deepening this and, and really doing the true work of public health going forward. Thank you. Meredith, Meredith, thank you so much. Lauren, do you wanna say anything? Yes, thank you. I, I mean, I just wanna echo everything that Meredith and Flora just said. And you know, I think some of the comments that they already made, we know throughout the country, public health officials right now are feeling um, sometimes attacked, sometimes unsupported and, you know, a lot of uh, fatigue. And I think the team we built here in North Suffolk has always felt like one big team and incredibly supportive. And it's been an honor to work alongside uh, Floor and Meredith uh, during this whole thing. I think there's a bond that forms when you're kind of in the trenches with people. And I know we have uh, that bond moving forward um, throughout, you know, the, as long as we continue to work together. Um, again, I wanted to say thank you to Barry and Mark, who um, are just as much a part of the team as the, the three of us, and many long nights with uh, Mark on the phone when we were trying to get those initial um, COVID vaccine uh, clinics up and running, and it just always, you know, always incredibly supportive. Um, I want to say thank you to our incredibly supportive administration here in Revere, Mayor Rigo, who, again, always says yes to anything I ask and um, is just one of the best people to work for that, I, that I've ever worked for. And then just finally, all the volunteers, the school nurses, the COVID ambassadors who are just as much a part of all of this work and we really couldn't have done um, what we have accomplished up until now without them. Um, they're somewhat of the unsung heroes through all of this and um, just always thinking about them and, and thank you so much for this honor. Thank you. Meredith, uh, Lauren and Floor, thank you for those words. Um, I want to note that when um, Lauren said a few words thanking Mark, she was not referring to me. She was referring to Mark Fine, our Director of Municipal Collaboration, who, along with Barry, uh, had the lion's share of the contact with uh, these three communities and with so many other communities in our region uh, in terms of on-the-ground COVID response and then the vaccination campaign. Uh, I do want to have a big thank you to Barry and to Mark and their staffs for everything they did, all the incredible work they did during the course of the pandemic. I also want to note that um, three people, some of whom I think are on the Zoom today, also offer their congratulations and admiration. And that is Tom Ambrosino, the city manager from Chelsea, uh, Brian Arrigo, the mayor of Revere, and Terry Delahanty, the acting uh, town manager in Winthrop. I know that all of them are very proud of you for everything you have accomplished and will continue to support you as you move forward. Uh, with that, I am going to call uh, this portion of the meeting to a close uh, with thanks to the awardees, to everyone who has participated, and of course, to the members of Teddy Mann's family. We appreciate our ongoing partnership with you. And I will turn it back over to my boss, Erin Morton. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to echo uh, thanks to the Mann family. Um, it's honestly one of my favorite parts of council is hearing Rick and the family speak. And um, it, it just it just really is a great way to celebrate um, uh, Teddy Mann's life. So thank you. And I also want to, you know, personally congratulate the um, award winners. Uh, I mean, the chat is completely blowing up rightfully so um and i think it's so inspiring all the work you do not only in the public health realm but i think it's a really great um it's a really great sign for how great we can all be with uh regional collaboration and i hope that you are you know uh the main case study uh, when we make that argument kind of moving forward all right and with that um uh, we are heading we are transitioning to the business meeting. Um, so first, I want to kind of go over some ground rules. Um, uh, so please um, be gracious in uh, allowing me to cover a few ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. So um, please uh, keep your phone or computer speaker muted unless you are asked to speak. Uh, please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. And finally, we'll be utilizing the Zoom chat feature for all motions, seconds, voting, and any questions. We will need you to be able to identify you throughout the meeting. 
please ensure that you have identified yourself and that you understand how to use the Zoom chat feature. So if you look at the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, one of the buttons should say chat with the image of a chat bubble. If you click on that, it will bring you to the chat. Uh, please make sure you are messaging everyone instead of the host or one of the co-hosts. I am um, infamous for um, private messaging instead of group messaging. So uh, take it from me, just message everyone. Uh, council members who call in rather than join by video have been asked by our technical support team to identify themselves to the team and have been renamed. So we are um, also keeping track of that as well. Uh, voting by phone participants will give um, an oral vote and will occur after all others have voted on a given motion. So at this time, I'm going to call up Sasha to call roll. Sasha is the events and special project specialist at MAPC. Um, just so we're all kind of on the same page, I know we're still kind of new at this, especially with large group meetings. Sasha um, began to take the role between 9.15 and 9.30 for those council members. Uh, role will be called to identify council members who have yet not been identified as present. So do not panic if your name is not called. Uh, if your name is not called, that means we have captured you as attending this meeting. Uh, we'll ask uh, members to identify themselves as present or here in the chat feature for the recording of the meeting. Um, and how we do this is the role of cities and towns will be in alphabetical order by municipality name. Um, if the city or town rep is not present, Sasha will then call the alternate rep. Gubernatorial members will be called in alphabetical order by last name. And finally, ex officio members or designees will then be called. Everyone got that? Great. Sasha, take it away. Thank you so much, Erin. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name. I will try my best uh, to pronounce it correctly. Um, I will start with the city and town caucus, um, beginning with Bolton, Erica Uriarte, Boston, John Barros, for the alternate, Caitlin Pasafaro, Braintree, James Downey, Brookline, Allison Steinfield, Canton, Boris Mead, Cohasset, Lauren Lind, Danvers, Aaron Henry, Dover, Christopher Dwelly, Uh, or the alternate John Jeffries, Essex, Peter Fiffin, Everett, Tony Sousa, Holliston, Tina Hain, Hull, Chris Diorio, Ipswich, Carolyn Britt, Lynn, James Marsh, Linfield, Robert Dolan, or the alternate, Emily Kadamatori, Manchester, Christine Delicio, Marblehead, Steve Lavrone, or the alternate, Rebecca Curran Cutting. Maynard, Chris De Silva, Middleton, Andrew Sheehan, or the alternate, Katrina O'Leary, Millis, Robert Wace, or the alternate, Nicole Riley, uh, Natick, Joshua Ostroff. Norfolk, uh, Richard McCarthy. Norwell, Bruce Graham. Norwood, Paul Halkiotis. Peabody, Kurt Bellavance. Quincy, Frank Tremontosi. Or the alternate, James Fatsius. 
Sagas, Jeanette Fasano. Situate, James Bedreau. Or the alternate, Kyle Boyd. Sherborne, Marion Nutra. Somerville, Joseph Curtatoni, or the alternate, George Karakis. Stowe, Jesse Stedman, or the alternate, Ellen Sturgis. Wakefield, Aaron Kokinda. Walpole, Paul Connolly, or the alternate, Ashley Clark. Weymouth, Robert Hudland, or the alternate, Carl Edsall. Wilmington, Valerie Gingrich. Winthrop, Austin Faison. Rentham, Rachel Benson, or the alternate, Kevin Sweet. I will now move on to gubernatorial candidates or members. Um, Alphabetical by last name, Zamawa Arenas, Lisa Broad, Sol Carbonell, Kelly Chun, Robert Cohen, John Featherston, Daniel Garcia de Coteau, Gina Martinez, Matilda, I'm um, oh, sorry, Gina Martinez, Stefan Silvera, Romani Serpada, Kelly Strong, Monica Tibbetts Nutt, William Tinty, Samuel Wong. I'll now call on the ex officio designees, Chris Osgood, Lauren Shirtliff, Sean Canty, Jim Montgomery, Courtney Rainey, Juan Vega, Kat Banesh, Vandana Rao, David Muller, John Bichard, uh, Joel Bar Barrera. That is uh, the list. And our total count currently, Erin, is 55. Great, thank you. I think there are a few in the um, chat. Um, so again, if you did hear your name, um, <clears throat> please indicate in the chat that you are present. If you did not hear your name, uh, that means we got you. So thank you so much all again for joining us. Erin, if I could just um, briefly break in here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we are at uh, 55. I think there are some others that uh, are clearly coming in through the chat that might bring us up to around 60, 62. We need to be at um, 68 in order to have quorum. So I think what we will do is we will continue with the business meeting and then the Metro Common presentation. Uh, some of us will be doing some direct outreach to folks who are not here, and hopefully we'll be able to achieve quorum by the time we come to a vote on Metro Common. If we don't, we are going to have to have either a special meeting or delay the adoption of Metro Common until the winter meeting, which would normally be in late February or March. So uh, for all of you who may not want to have a special meeting and who also have other friends on the council who are not here, this is your opportunity to text them and get them to sign in, please. Uh, we're close. I think we can make it, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so um, I know next up on the agenda is the approval of the annual council meeting minutes from May. 
Um, they are not available at this time. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna approve those minutes at the winter council meeting, along with the minutes for today's meeting. I just wanted to kind of get everyone on the same page about that. Great, so next up is the announcement of MPO results. So Eric Barraza, MAPC Transportation Director, um, take it away. Is Eric uh, at the meeting? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I had to be given approval to unmute. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Barassa, the Director of Transportation at MAPC, and I'm here to announce the results of the 2021 Boston uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization Municipal Election. As many of you know, the Boston MPO is the entity where federal and state and regional and local government comes together to jointly decide how we, uh, how we spend and program the federal transportation uh, dollars that come into the region. Um, the MPO has 22 voting members and 12 of those members are municipalities from the region that can run uh, to be uh, for a seat on the MPO board. Um, out of the 97 municipalities that, that make up the region. Um, MAPC, along with the MBTA Advisory Board, um, we oversee the municipal election process. Um, and I'm happy to announce those results. Um, the town of Arlington um, has been reelected for the at-large town seat. The city of Newton has been reelected for the at-large city seat. The town of Norwood has been uh, reelected for the Three Rivers Interlocal Council seat. And the town of Burlington has been uh, newly voted in for the North Suburban Planning Council seat. So that's really exciting that we have a new municipality who will be joining the MPO for the first time. And we're really looking forward. And I, I just want to thank uh, the city of Woburn um, and Mayor Galvin and uh, Tina Cassidy, who represented the mayor for many years at the MPO. Uh, for providing a tremendous amount of um, involvement and leadership um, from the North Suburban Planning Council, but it's great to have the town of Burlington now. Um, just want to remind everyone that, um, that the next MPO meeting is uh, November 4th, um, next Thursday at 10 a.m., and I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for the municipalities that ran for these seats and for the folks uh, who voted and were able to submit their votes electronically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, uh, for that exciting news. Um, and congratulations to all. I hope you uh, find your participation on the MPO uh, really rewarding. Um, great. All right, next up is the report of the executive director, Mark Drayson. Mark? Erin, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just summarize a few key things going on at MAPC these days, let people know what's happening in those topic areas. As always, if you uh, want more information or if you want information on any of the myriad things we don't mention or I don't mention, please, uh, please just give me a buzz or, or send me an email. I'll always get back to you. Uh, we are very heavily focused right now on the issue of spending ARPA dollars, the American Rescue Plan funds. Those come in many uh, broad categories. Uh, they come in funds that are available to municipalities directly or through counties. We are working with at least a dozen of our cities and towns to help them with various issues of ARPA spending. Everything from figuring out what useful and, and good expenditures would be to carrying out engagement processes with the public to try and have input on ARPA expenditures to helping cities and towns to deal with the somewhat complicated reporting requirements the federal government places upon us. Uh, we are also working uh, very actively, particularly Lizzie Wyant and her um, government affairs team uh, in uh, coordination with and advocacy in the legislature on the expenditure of state funds that come to us through ARPA. Uh, the state funds came uh, directly to the Commonwealth. Uh, initially, we thought that perhaps the governor was going to allocate most of those funds directly 
as he had with funds from previous recovery packages during the pandemic. But the legislature decided, now nah, this time we want to be involved, Charlie. So uh, they, uh, they voted to uh, basically put the funds in a trust for appropriation. And we have been encouraging the legislature to move quickly on at least a portion of those funds, especially the funds that might be spent by supplementing existing state programs and funds that are needed for those most in need as a result of the pandemic and the recession that accompanied it. Uh, a couple of days ago, we were rewarded uh, with the House package that came out on ARPA spending. Uh, it's not the whole package. I think it's somewhere between three and four billion, if I recall correctly. That is not chump change. And uh, we were very pleased with a lot of the items in that package. Most particularly, I would note that within the housing package, we had been pushing for money to be available for the modernization of public housing projects both family and elderly public housing, and a significant amount of money was included for that purpose. We also felt that the, uh, it was necessary to provide significant dollars for the strengthening of our public health infrastructure. We, one of the things we're really pushing on these days is to remind people that public health has ongoing COVID expenditures in regard to contact tracing, which the state is not doing anymore after December 1st, in regard to the vaccination program and now with young children and boosters, and in regard to the fact that people are still getting ill, being hospitalized and dying. So there are, there are lots of expenditures and it's not fair for those expenditures to be borne entirely by cities and towns. The state has to assist with that as well. Uh, there are many other aspects to the ARPA bill. Of course, this wouldn't be MAPC if we didn't have a summary that was prepared, I believe by Leah Robbins. And that is available to anyone who asks. Honestly, it's probably up on the MAPC website. I'm not 100% sure of that. Lizzie can indicate that in the chat, however. We are going to continue to work on ARPA. Uh, it's a very important element of our work at this point in time. These are very substantial kind of once in a lifetime resources. We wanna make sure they are spent, spent on time, spent well, and especially spent in the communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic. And that word community doesn't always mean a municipality. It can mean a type of person. It can mean people with you know, seniors, people in nursing homes, people with disabilities, women who have been uh, pushed out of the workforce. It can mean many different things. The word community has many different definitions. And we wanna make sure that the funds are used to benefit those individuals and those communities. Uh, there is another category to ARPA spending that people don't often recognize or pay much attention to. That is the fact that a lot of federal agencies have discretionary ARPA money, which they are going to release through competitive RFPs. And recently, uh, MAPC, with a coalition of around 50 other organizations uh, that we coordinate, uh, apply to the Economic Development Administration for a $500,000 planning grant, and then we hope in phase two, a substantial uh, implementation grant uh, to try and improve and grow the cybersecurity sector in Massachusetts, to address broadband issues in the digital divide, to make sure that many of the people who have lost jobs in the course of the pandemic have the opportunity to train for and participate in this growing segment of our economy. Uh, and we are awaiting the results of that, uh, that application, but that is only one. Many other uh, organizations uh, are filing applications, an important one uh, with the city of Boston that we're working on that would be throughout the state, relates to clean energy in residential buildings, we're also active in that. And there are many other uh, departments that will be coming up with RFPs. Maybe a week, two weeks, a month down the road, we may have an infrastructure package and we might actually have the social service and human services package that I know uh, Congress is working on presently. But for the moment, we have ARPA, and it's important to make sure that those monies are well spent. Another area that I wanted to speak about a little bit uh, is, is a little more internal to MAPC. And that is that, as you know, in July, uh, our long serving and much loved Deputy Director Rebecca Davis moved on to a new job. Uh, she couldn't get too far away from us, so she worked, moved from MAPC to MACP. Uh, where she is now the chief operating officer. 
And thankfully, Rebecca's still in the Boston region and we're still working with her, for example, on that EDA application. Uh, however, uh, it has uh, called uh, upon me, our directors and the officers to evaluate the, um, the management structure at MAPC. You know, when I came to MAPC almost 20 years ago, there were 30 staff and three deputy directors. And Rebecca, when Rebecca left in July, there were 105 staff and one deputy director. Uh, and I'm still one person. So uh, it doesn't really make all that much sense uh, to run the organization with only one deputy. And we have uh, decided upon a new structure that will involve the hiring of three deputies, one to oversee uh, public affairs and advocacy, the second to oversee uh, sustainable development or community planning, and the third to oversee administration. And we will be filling those positions sequentially beginning with the Deputy Director for Public Affairs and Advocacy. Uh, I am very confident that adding this layer of uh, strength uh, and capability and talent to MAPC from both internal or external candidates for these jobs is going to help make my life easier, maybe a tiny bit easier, allow me to concentrate on some things that I haven't been able to concentrate on thus far, uh, create a deeper bench of leadership at the organization, and provide really a partnership of a key executive team, uh, which shouldn't just be two people, it should be larger than that. Uh, and I think that's going to be a benefit to the organization. I think it's going to be a benefit to the region. And I hope that all of you will not only monitor this, but when the job descriptions come out, encourage people to apply. And uh, we are also continuing to grow at MAPC uh, in two ways, I would say. One is we're simply adding positions. Every time we we seem to say, well, we're going to stop now, we're going to slow down, we're not going to grow anymore, we don't have any more space. Uh, people ask us to do new things and work on new projects. And I am pleased to say that we're hiring just some fabulous new people at the agency uh, who come from all over the country uh, and who are bringing tremendous talent here. You see, at yesterday's staff meeting we introduced, including a couple of interns, seven new people at the agency. The other thing that we're dealing with, I want to be very upfront about, which is like, Every organization in America, public or private, people are leaving, moving on to new things, living in new places, deciding to be closer to family, wanting to change their careers, and that's a little bit of a churn at the agency. Uh, but thankfully, we have continued to get great applicants, even for those positions. And uh, it's always important to have great staff in the MAPC Alumni Association because they keep working with us and they keep adding to our strength and power all over the region and all over the country. Uh, so I wanted to update you a little bit on that. I don't usually talk about management issues in these, in these reports. I usually talk more about policy issues, but I felt that was an important thing to, to update you on as the governing body of this organization. So with that, I'm going to conclude my ED report. And I think I'm supposed to turn it over to the Metro Common portion. Is that right, Erin? All right. For the past three years, there's been no more important activity in MAPC than developing our new regional plan. It's one of the few things we are required by statute to do. Last regional plan, Metro Future, took us about eight years to do. About half of those were during my tenure. Uh, and we involved 5,000 people in that effort, but we could, we could see them face to face all the time. Uh, this year, and, and that was adopted in 2008, it's already 13 years ago. Three years ago, we began working on, on Metro Common 2050, new regional plan to take us out to 2050, uh, which has been led by our director of strategic initiatives, Eric Hove, which has literally involved the participation of virtually every staff member and board member at MAPC. During the first part of this planning process, we were in person, it was pre-pandemic, but we were only, I would say, about a third of the way, halfway through the process when the pandemic and the recession struck and it became necessary to recalibrate the kind of work we were doing and to really figure out how do you develop a regional plan in the midst of a pandemic and social isolation. We had to deal with the disease and illness and dislocation caused by COVID. We had to deal with the recession, so many people losing their jobs and worrying about whether or not they were going to, where they were going to get their next meal and cities and towns wondering if they were going to be able to maintain their budgets. And we had to deal with an enormous reckoning in this country around social justice by race uh, for workers uh, and for low income people, uh, all of which was a tremendous challenge 
to being able to develop a regional plan. Uh, I am proud to say that under Eric's leadership and with the assistance of so many others at the agency, I, I hesitate to name them, but I, I will note um, Emily Torres Cullinane, the co-director of strategic initiatives, uh, Sasha Perotti, uh, who is online now and just called the role uh, and is our special events coordinator, helped with so much of our outreach activities. Uh, Lizzie Grobel, uh, who's no longer at the agency, but uh, prior to that during her tenure here played a tremendous role in this effort. Rebecca Davis during her time here on the government affairs side, Lizzie Wyant and Kasha Hart, who really spearheaded the policy recommendations. Uh, Tim Reardon and Sarah Philbrick in data services, Jesse Partridge Guerrero, who helped with scenario planning. And of course, the entire communications team led by Amanda Linehan, Karen Edelman, uh, Elise and Kit, so many people who worked so hard on this project. All of them had to figure out how to do something we had never done before. At the beginning of Metro Common, we made a conscious decision that we were going to tweak or adjust Metro Future. That didn't happen. COVID, George Floyd, a national election, many other things demanded that we be more forceful, bolder, more heavily focused on equity in our region. And to be perfectly honest, less patient for change. And the plan that we put before you today is a plan in that spirit. It is transformative yet achievable. It is detailed and multi-topical. Uh, it is drawn from the thousands of people we interacted with both in person and virtually. It is, I think, a plan that will serve the Commonwealth, our cities and towns, and the people who live and work in the region. I wanna congratulate everyone on the staff and council who worked on it, who really put their heart into this effort. And I think who saw this effort as a way that they could make sense out of the pandemic and leave something behind that would lead to a better life in our region and for ourselves and for our families. And uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Eric. But before I do that, I think I wanna make, Aaron, if it's okay with you, a quick check on the quorum issue. I don't know that we've actually achieved quorum, but I'm gonna check with Sasha to see where we are at the moment. I, I'm seeing her shake her head. Yeah. So uh, Mark, maybe um, once you turn it over to Eric, uh, you can shut your camera off and get on that phone and uh, get a couple more people on here. Where are we at the moment? We are at 56. Okay. Um, so uh, while Eric and his team uh, do the presentation, we'll see if we can ruffle up a few more people and we'll report back to folks on that. Great, thank you, Mark. Thank Eric Hove, I think. Thank you, Mark and Aaron. Uh, my name is Eric Hove. I'm the co-director of strategic initiatives. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, what we hope will be our next regional plan, Metro Common 2050, shaping our region together. It was 13 years ago when this council last adopted our regional plan, Metro Future. Today, we're gonna to walk through some of the highlights of the Metro Common plan, I'm joined by my colleagues, Kasha Hart and Emily Torres Cullinane. We'll have some time for questions and feedback, and then we'll be asking for your vote to adopt this as the next regional plan. The MAPC region is made up of 101 cities and towns, as you all know, each of them with their unique history, specific personalities, and particular challenges. But we also share much in common and depend one another on our success uh, moving forward. The regional plan and our strategic priorities is really what guides our work uh, through MAPC. But the regional plan does more than that. It also sets a course really for the future of our entire region, one that we hope we can achieve by working together. And the technical assistance that we provide to our cities and towns is really directed by our regional plan. And not only the technical assistance, but also our legislative advocacy, research, and data agendas. And like I said, 13 years ago was when Metro Future was adopted. 
It set out a bold smart growth vision for the region, one that also calls for much greater regional collaboration across municipal boundaries. And in certain ways, we really have seen significant progress towards these goals in the last 13 years. To take one example, our cities and towns have seen tremendous invest investments over that period. And to take another, while working across municipal boundaries is never easy, especially in Massachusetts, uh, we have seen unprecedented collaboration as a result of the pandemic response as evidenced by the MAN Award winners that you heard earlier today. But in recent years, uh, it really has shown a brighter light on both the acute and chronic crises that are unfolding across the region, whether it's the high cost of housing, a transportation system that doesn't work for most of us, great disparities along racial and ethnic lines, and even the, um, the, climate, the climate change impacts that we're seeing even today outside our windows. And this was the stage uh, that we inherited it as we sat down to begin the work of Metro Common 2050. And this plan that we're asking for your vote uh, really was the work of thousands of people working together. We were guided by a dynamic and diverse external advisory committee, a community advisory committee, our executive committee as well. And we talked to people really throughout the region, starting in person with sub-regional events from the North Shore to the South Shore to Metro West. And then as the pandemic hit, we had to pivot to a remote only online engagement platform. We also met with state municipal leaders, had municipal breakfasts uh, to kick off each of the, year, the planning years of the plan. In the first year of planning, uh, we asked people what their visions for the future was. What does Metro Boston look like if we're to succeed? What does our neighborhood look like? What, do, what does our environment, how does our environment work? Um, and then we moved into year two, where we asked people and explored what we believe are our biggest challenges that we have to overcome to meet that vision, as well as the greatest opportunities that we can build on as we move forward. We also introduced the concept of key uncertainties. How, do, how can we adapt when things that we're not planning for show up, um, including growth, pro growth projections on a variety of scales over time? And in the last year, we really focused on the actions needed to get us to the goals. Not only the actions that MAPC can take, but the actions that our state legislature and our city and town governments can take as well. And we really sought to, to create a plan that people are excited to implement. We wanted to provide a sense of agency and hope for the future that we're not just victims of what happens um, through external forces, but that we have the ability and the wherewithal to shape the future that we really want. And building on the, the core tenets of Metro Common of smart growth and regional collaboration, we also set, set out to really center equity and resiliency as two more core tenets of both MAPC's work and what we hope will happen in the long term for our region. And finally, when it comes to implementation, we're not able to implement this plan alone. We're gonna to have to maintain and build strong relationships, again, with the cities and towns, state officials, and community-based organizations to really push this, push this agenda forward and, and to realize our shared, our shared dreams. We set out to establish that bold yet achievable long-term goals for the region. It's gonna take a lot of hard work to get there, but I'm convinced that we can do it. As I mentioned just a little bit ago, we introduced uncertainties and projections uh, for future growth. And we spent a lot of time at, um, really developing products, web tools, and research to help our allies, our stakeholders, and our constituents, our cities and towns, help to better understand the dynamics that are at play in our region, and also to help them in Im implementing their local priorities as well. And finally, we set out to really push the envelope on recommendations that we can act on in the short term and the next two to six years that will set us on that path for long-term success. In the last year and a half was unexpected to say the least. Life has been upended in so many ways, but as we rebuild, there is some cause for hope. To take one example, early on in the pandemic, there was great fear over what was gonna to happen to our state and local budgets. 
But now, thanks in, in large part to federal funding, we have a once in a generation opportunity to start building back in a much more equitable and sustainable manner. What are we gonna to continue to do is this plan will evolve into a digital plan, one that will be much more accessible, easy to navigate, and one that will be translated into Spanish as well. We also uh, are developing indicators that will help us measure the progress the region is making towards the goals of the plan or away from them, if that may be the case. Uh, one of the indicators that we recently developed looks at where new development happens and it has some sobering conclusions. In the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, just under 70% of new housing units were built in the 1% floodplain. That's 9,000 units of new housing that's vulnerable to climate impacts. And what about commercial development? Nearly 60% of commercial development was also located and constructed in these same floodplains. And here's the vision that we laid out, uh, the vision that we heard uh, as we talked to people throughout the region. What do they want for transportation? What do they want from climate? We actually really do want to hit net zero. Sooner the better in, in order to limit the impacts of climate change. We want healthy and safe neighborhoods. We want to give people the ability to thrive and to pass on wealth to future generations. And finally, our, our action areas are the main organization of the plan. These again are the topic areas that we heard have the greatest opportunities as well as the greatest challenges that we must overcome in the years ahead. And in these action areas, we also commissioned artists to help tell stories, to help shed a new light and to put a human face on these challenges and opportunities that, that we explored. And finally, they are the container for the recommendations or the actions to get us on the path to success. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kasha Hart, who's gonna talk through the recommendations. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Again, my name is Kasha Hart and I'm a policy analyst with the government affairs team. First, I just wanna give um, a special shout out to Lizzie Wyatt, who's our government affairs director, who co-led the development of the policy recommendations with me. I also just wanna take a minute and give kudos to all of the staff that worked on these 20 policy chapters. I know I personally learned so much from their expertise and I'm just so grateful for their patience and their persistence as we work through the many drafts of the recommendations and ultimately got to the final drafts that we are sharing with you today. Um, this process also leaned on the expertise and the experience of so many people from outside of the agency that Mark and Eric have already spoken to, but just want to speak for a moment on all of the engagement that happened around the recommendations specifically. So the engagement process was incredibly thorough and that is thanks in great part due to the work of Emily Torres Cullinane and Sasha Perotti. Um, but we conducted focus groups for all 20 policy chapters, meeting with policy experts and advocates and members of partner organizations. We also conducted focus groups with members of the legislature, as well as with individuals who would be most impacted by the recommendations. And we read through all of the input, and I think these final documents are all stronger as a result of, of the feedback and the comments that we received. Um, so I just want to put a little bit of emphasis on all of the people that have played a role in getting us to where we are today. Next slide, please. So here are just a couple of points of emphasis or common themes across the recommendations. Um, first, as you know, Mark has already spoken about, an equitable and resilient recovery. The recommendations are one of the shorter term components of the plan. And so while the plan is Metro Common 2050, the policy recommendations are intended to be implemented on a shorter timeline, closer to 2030 or so. We know we're going to be in, in recovery for a long time and feeling the economic consequences of the pandemic for a long time. So it was important to us that we address that head on in the plan. And we really think about how we are confronting um, some of the inequities that have been laid bare over the past 18 months. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we're addressing root causes. So this is a common theme that emerged in all of our focus groups. We were really encouraged not to just put band-aids on different issues, not to you know, focus on the symptoms of a problem, 
but instead it uses as an opportunity to start to chip away at some of the structural issues that lead to the inequities that we see today. So another common theme is addressing synergies or connections across different recommendations. Um, this came out through, again, throughout all of the focus groups. As you read through the documents, you'll see that we tried to cross-reference the recommendations where we could, where we thought it was appropriate, but just a couple of places where those sort of cross-connections um, happened. Home ownership as a primary vehicle for building wealth. So we talk about that in both of our wealth building recommendation and our um, affordable home, home ownership access recommendation. Um, we are seeing just a really strong connection between public health and climate change and how land use in the built environment plays a role in, in all of that. So we wanted to make sure those recommendations were all interconnected with one another. Um, obviously, accelerating electrification, that has major implications both for the building sector, the so homes and businesses, as well as the transportation sector. And then finally, more inclusive and collaborative regional governments. Themes from the dynamic and representative government recommendation really cut across all 20 of the policy chapters. And we saw during the pandemic the importance of local governments working together. And we just want to make sure we're enabling more of that in the future. Next slide. So finally, we just wanted to highlight a couple of particularly innovative recommendations that are included in the plan. Um, so first is this idea of creating a climate infrastructure bank. Um, we're really excited about this idea. This is included in MAPC's equitable recovery priorities as well as our ARPA priorities. Um, we think this is really important for catalyzing an equitable and resilient recovery. By creating this kind of infrastructure bank, we can put some initial capital Towards, um, towards major mitigation and resiliency projects. And so this can act as a vehicle for making those down payments um, on, on these major projects that could potentially later be supported by federal recovery dollars. Next is this idea of providing resources for small businesses to move to employee-owned models. So cooperatives or employee stock ownership plan or ESOP plan models can be a way to promote resiliency of small businesses and give workers a larger say in business decisions. Next, we have a recommendation around establishing a clean energy community benefits fund and a commission on energy justice. So funds for clean energy, this, the fund specifically would be used um, to make investments in clean energy infrastructure and environmental justice communities and in other communities that have been historically prevented from accessing clean energy. And the commission is, is there to sort of guide the implementation of this fund. Next, this is a very MAPC um, recommendation, but setting a statewide VMT reduction goal. So climate has really emerged as a common theme across all 20 of, of the policy chapters. And we know that reducing emissions from transportation is going to rely have heavily on electrification, but we felt it was really important to take a holistic approach to this issue and also talk about the implications of land use and transit investments in reducing emissions. So we thought a step forward um, to advance that goal would be for the Commonwealth to establish a statewide VMT reduction goal. We know VMT also reducing VMT also offers a host benefits in both the environmental, economic, and public health space. And then finally, this last idea about facilitating public banking, this was just endorsed by our executive committee, and it will help expand financial service, access to financial services for individuals and small businesses, and also ensure that banks are meeting community-specific needs. So I think with that, if you want to go to the next slide, I'm going to turn things over to Emily torres Cullinane to give you a preview of what is next. Thank you so much, Kasha, and thank you so much, Eric, uh, for this morning's presentation. So upon adopting Metro Common, um, when we can do the vote, uh, we will be kicking off Metro Common 2052U, a series of local conversations and presentations of the regional plan. What does that mean for you, your municipality, agency, or organization? Well, we'd like to come to you and discuss the recommendations in depth. We'll tailor the content to your needs, your schedule, and your shared priorities. We are happy to present at public or internal meetings, 
with governmental or non-governmental bodies. Everyone has a role in making our region a more equitable and sustainable region. Uh, from here on in, we are also looking to partner with you. We want to know what Metro Common recommendations do you care deeply about? What priorities do, we sh do you share with the plan? How can we work together to elevate certain components of the plan? We are looking for anyone that would like to advocate for Metro Common and collaborate on its implementation. Please reach out to us if you're interested to discuss that um, a little bit more. I also want to add a quick note here on the plan's products that you can use in your work. Uh, Eric mentioned some of them. When we started the design of Metro Common, you asked for research and web tools, uh, messaging support, and best practices and policy, policy ideas. We encourage you to use the research that was done throughout this planning process. Some examples include the housing submarkets, the diversity deficit report, and the zoning atlas. We encourage you to use the storytelling pieces, such as the short film Living Together, the At Home in Boston video, and the action area illustrations that we've been sharing in MAPC Matters Monthly. Uh, they will also be on the digital hub. And we encourage you to explore and use the best practices and policy ideas and the recommendations. MAPC has already actually started to incorporate some of them into our current policy agenda. And lastly, in the spring, we will be rolling out Metro Common with a formal in-person kickoff event and media campaign. We'll be translating our documents and making sure to share back the plan with everyone that participated in the building of the regional plan. So stay tuned for those details and how you can participate. Next slide. So what does implementation look like and what role can you play? Sign up for the Metro Common to You presentation by clicking on the link that Sasha is going to add into the chat or contact Eric Hove. Endorse the plan. For example, one of our external advisory committee members, James Ficcioni, the senior director at the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative has already moved to adopt Metro Common 2050, making it an age-friendly plan. Join the rollout event in the spring. We would love to see you in person. And if you would like to present or speak, please let us know. Share the plan widely with your constituents, peers, and collaborators. This spring, we'll have social media cards for you to post and share. And hopefully sooner than that, we can send out uh, the, the website, the digital hub that you can also share uh, with your colleagues and partner with us. I can't say that enough. This, end, and this endeavor can be achieved. However, MAPC cannot do it on our own. We need you. We need your support. We need your action. Once adopted, you become the implementers of this plan. All right, so with that, I thank you all and I pass it on to Erin, I believe. Yes, thank you, Eric, Kasha, and Emily. Um, I can't even believe it's been three years, but um, it's it's a really incredible document. Um, and at this time, we're going to open it up for discussions or questions um, and feedback. So what we're going to do to kind of maximize uh, this opportunity here, I'm going to ask if there are any questions at this time. Um, during the discussion period, I'm going to ask participants or interested parties to raise your hand. Um, when I say raise your hand, I mean I want you to uh, use the reaction button to raise your hand. So uh, when you look on the chat, you see Emily's face right now. Underneath Emily uh, is the reaction button. You click on that. I see Adam is in the is waiting right now, but you want to just click on raise hand. Um, and I will call you in the order in which I uh, see you. So Adam. Uh, go ahead, Adam of Burlington. Hi, thank you, Aaron, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, quick thank you to Eric and Kasha and Emily and the whole team that worked to put together this amazing plan. Um, I, I really don't have a question. I, I wanted to lend a supportive comment to the excellent work and the excellent product that you've produced. Um, I think comprehensively, Metro Common rises to the myriad challenges that we have before us as a region. Um, and, and it rises to them in a manner that produces recommendations that are applicable to the smallest towns within the region, as well as the largest cities. 
and, and within that context pr produces or provides a wide range of options for consideration. Um, I'd add that as some of us read it or some of those on the call and then those in our communities read it, there, there will be parts of this plan that are hard to read and hard to consider how we'll go about implementing them. But I think that speaks to the challenges that we have before us and the importance of working hard, having hard discussions in our communities to meet those challenges and to try to uh, achieve the vision that Metro Common has laid out. Um, and then I think the final thing I would say is I hope we can all do it in a manner where we go hard on the issues, but easy on the people, because we have big, big issues to tackle, uh, but we're all humans trying to find our way forward in this increasingly challenging world. So with that, I really want to congratulate you for a job well done and look forward to supporting this plan and working towards its implementation in the decade to come. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, that was great. Uh, next up, with their hand raised, is Keith Bergman of Littleton. Keith? Thanks very much. Um, I'm uh, a member of the External Advisory uh, Committee uh, that's been working these last several years, and I'm also immediate past president of MAPC, and so I've been uh, working. I, I even remember uh, Metro Future in uh, 2008, as many on the call do. <clears throat> and I've been proud to see this organization uh, continue to develop as a leading voice, not only in our Commonwealth, but in our country uh, for smart growth and regional collaboration. And to me, Metro Common 2050 represents some of the very best work that MAPC has ever done. Uh, work uh, that is the regional planning agency for Metro Boston, it is uniquely called upon to do. Um, and I appreciate very much the boldness and the vision and the thoughtfulness uh, of this very consequential uh, plan. Uh, it's focused on the impacts of climate change and equity and economic justice are particularly timing and compelling. In every way, it is worthy of the great organization that MAPC uh, has become. And I would urge uh, fellow council members uh, to adopt Metro Common 2050. Thanks so much. Thank you, Keith. Uh, if anyone else, uh, thank you for those who just joined. You must have got our text messages or emails. I appreciate it. But if you have a question or comment on the plan, uh, please. Um, raise your hand in um, the reaction section. So you see Keith's picture right now, right under it is that smiley face plus um, image, click on that and then click raise hand if you have any uh, anything to say or um, if not at this time, I'll just give it a couple more seconds. Okay, um, so I am um, going to call on Mark. I don't know if he's ready to talk. Oh, I'm sorry, Kara, you just popped up. So uh, Kara of Brookline, uh, go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, thank you. Just wanted to ask really quick that MAPC consider in future regional plans, including in the introduction, an explicit statement about which policy, regulatory, or funding realms the, this regional plan has a direct or indirect fluence, influence. Um, for example, the work that Eric spoke about earlier, but also about how it informs regional transportation funding and serves as a regional guidebook for EDA grants. <clears throat> I think this kind of straightforward statement in the document would help people understand why they should participate in the process. It would help us explain the importance of this document to our local leaders while helping them discern that in most cases, MAPC's setting of regional goals will actually have very little direct influence in their flexibility to govern locally, at least in the immediate timeframe. That could help um, uh, right size their concern or excitement about a regional plan. Um, and I look very much forward to supporting this plan and hope you'll consider that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. For your and I don't think, Carol, we need to wait 10 years before we include such a statement. We can 
that I, I would regard that as kind of a minor modification that you could probably incorporate something to that effect in the introductory documents. <clears throat> All right, I am seeing no other hands raised. Um, Mark? Um, well, it is kind of, you know, it is kind of truth time in terms of quorum. I, I think it's important to remember that we are facing power outages throughout the region. Even a few of the people who have joined in the last few minutes have said they're joining by phone because they can't use their computers. Um, uh, Sasha, what, what number are we at at the moment? I think it's 61 or 62. 61. Okay. So I don't, I don't see any realistic way in which we can reach 68, which is a requirement. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have to, you know, either do a special meeting or do this at the winter council meeting, which will be at the end of February or early March. Um, and, uh, and that's just the way it is. We didn't, uh, we didn't, you know, we've had four council meetings since COVID began. So we've had four council meetings virtually we have achieved quorum at every single one of them but we did not have power outages at the previous four and even as sasha was reading the role i kind of was picking up on the geography of the people who were missing and could see some patterns there i think particularly north of the city so um we will re-caucus and figure out a way to handle approval but i don't think we're going to be able to have the vote today and Mark, just something in the chat uh, that kind of uh, has been brought up is that um, to incorporate Kara's um, suggestion as part of the future vote. And I, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. And I don't see a reason why we can't do that in this document. I don't, I don't want to have to wait another 10 years for another regional plan. I don't think I'm going to be involved in that regional plan. So um, we, I, I will work with Eric and the rest of the team to make sure at least a few sentences uh, in the direction of Cara's suggestion are included. Great, thank you. Yes, unfortunately, uh, quorum or a lack of quorum doesn't allow us to formally vote at this time. Um, I love the excitement for a special meeting, uh, but um, we will have a conversation about it offline and um, go from there. And I agree, the sooner the better, right, Richard? Uh, because I, I already see the excitement uh, that people have and wanting to start to implement this and talk strategies and really start to work together. I think we're all feeling really inspired today. Um, so unfortunately we can't vote, but um, I am loving all this excitement. And I agree, thank you so much uh, for all your work, MEPC, the External Advisory Committee and everyone that's here today. Um, Mark, is there any other business not known at the time of this agenda? No, there is not. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do uh, at this point is I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. Will you please, um, if anyone would like to do that, please put that in the chat. Oh, Josh, are you looking to do that not in the chat? Josh from Nadek. Oh, okay. I see Move you. second, whichever. So, so. Oh, totally understand uh we're in very weird times so uh the motion was made by yolanda green uh aggrieves of ashland and the second was made by josh of natick to adjourn the meeting um uh, motion is made and seconded council members if you will please vote in the chat first the ayes and then if you feel so inclined to uh nay um, or abstain, you may do so now at any time. But I am seeing majority come through the chat. And with that, uh, the fall council meeting is adjourned at 1104. Thank you all for coming. Be safe. And I will see you hopefully very soon. Have a good one.